China is rising. Its economy is now the second largest in the world. China is the world's largest trader, having surpassed the United States, and Chinese military capabilities are expanding. In just a few decades, China has moved from the periphery to the center of the international system. But what does that really mean for the world? In some ways, China is a developed country, yet in other ways, it is still developing. China's transformation is often misunderstood, and the future of Chinese power is uncertain. Power itself is a nebulous concept. Power can be relative, it can be absolute, it can be perceived and anticipated. So how can we decipher power? Through China Power, CSIS unpacks the complexity of China's rise by analyzing the key components of Chinese power. What are China's strengths? What are its weaknesses? Does China's rise present a threat or an opportunity? Or both? What questions are you asking? Join the conversation at chinapower.csis.org. On August 2, 2011, President Obama signed into law the Budget Control Act. Five years later, it's worth reflecting on how it came into existence and what it has meant for the U.S. military. In the spring of 2011, the federal deficit was projected to peak at $1.5 trillion. Republicans had just taken control of the House. Democrats wanted to increase the debt ceiling, but Republicans insisted on dollar-for-dollar -dollar cuts in spending. Both sides refused to yield, forcing a fiscal standoff. What emerged was the Budget Control Act, a resurrection of a much older law known as graham rudman hollings The BCA reinstated budget caps for the discretionary parts of the federal budget. These caps were set to meet a deficit reduction target over the next 10 years. For defense, this meant about a trillion dollars less than the president had requested. Like the original graham rudman hollings law, the BCA created an exception for war funding, but we'll get back to that in a moment. The BCA was really intended to be a forcing function for a broader budget deal, so the law created the so-called Super Committee with special authority to propose a deficit reduction package subject to a simple up or down vote in both chambers. It also resurrected sequestration, the automatic process of making across-the-board budget cuts. After the first year of enforcement, however, sequestration is only triggered if Congress appropriates more than the budget caps allow. Despite much finger-pointing after the fact, the BCA passed with bipartisan majorities in both chambers. A lot has happened since the BCA was enacted. By November 2011, the Super Committee officially gave up, unable to forge a broader budget deal. Throughout 2012, defense leaders repeatedly warned about the consequences of the cuts imposed by the BCA, but steadfastly refused to plan for it. And now the wolf's at the door. In January 2013, Congress passed a last-minute budget deal that increased the budget cap slightly for 2013, but it paid for these increases in part by reducing the caps for 2014. By March, time had run out and sequestration was triggered. The across-the-board cuts forced DOD to cancel training, delay maintenance, and furlough more than 600,000 civilian workers. In late 2013, Congress passed a second budget deal that raised the budget caps for 2014 and 2015. Both Congress and the administration stuck to this deal over the next two years, thus avoiding sequestration. In late 2015, Congress passed a third deal that also raised the budget caps for two years. Unlike previous deals, however, it added $8 billion in war funding for defense and $8 billion in war funding for non-defense. Yes, war funding for the non-defense side of the budget. I told you we'd get back to that exception. The BCA does not provide a detailed definition for what constitutes war-related funding. So in effect, it is whatever Congress and the President agree it is. And because war funding does not count against the budget cap, it effectively creates a loophole. DOD has used this loophole in its budget request by relabeling roughly $25 to $30 billion from its base budget as being Afghanistan related. While DOD certainly felt budgetary pain in 2013, the three budget deals and the use of OCO funding have kept the defense budget near the level it was before the cuts began. 
Looking forward, the budget caps remain at their original level for 2018 to 2021. These caps were set to meet an arbitrary deficit reduction target without regard for strategy or need, and much has changed in the world over the past five years. The caps have also created a pattern of last-minute deals and OCO funding gimmicks that have made rational, long-term planning difficult. To break out of this pattern, the next administration will need to strike a long-term budget deal, or else the last five years of the BCA could be a lot like the first five. Iran's potential nuclear capability is the focus of international concern. But its conventional missile arsenal poses another critical threat. Tehran appears to have a clear objective. Development of nuclear weapons on one front and short and long-range missiles on the other to create a powerful regional deterrent and the ability to pressure and intimidate its neighbors. The potential for a nuclear-armed Iran worries leaders from Jerusalem to Washington, Riyadh, and beyond. The fear is that Iran could couple nuclear weapons to its long-range missiles. Iran began to develop its missile arsenal in the 1980s. It drew on designs from Russia, China, and North Korea, and it now has the largest deployed rocket and missile force in the Middle East approximately 1,000 rockets and missiles, with ranges from 90 to 1,200 miles. The arsenal includes the Shahab-3, which can reach any target in Israel. It can carry a payload of up to 2,200 pounds, and it's accurate enough to hit city-sized targets. Iran claims to have deployed nearly 100 of them. The Seiji-2 is Tehran's newest missile with a range of more than 1,200 miles. A solid fuel system powers it. Iran claims that anti-radar material makes it stealthy and hard to detect. It may have better accuracy and quicker launch capabilities than the Shahab-3. These are only two examples from an arsenal of at least 1,000 short and long-range missiles and rockets. This force allows Iran to compensate for a lack of conventional air power. Iran can also strike large area targets, potentially attacking the cities of its Gulf neighbors in Israel. At the same time, the effectiveness of Iran's arsenal is limited because the missiles aren't accurate enough to hit key military and infrastructure targets. Still, Iran may be able to make this threat far more serious development of a terminal guidance system to make its missiles far more accurate, or of nuclear warheads would change the equation, the balance of power in the Gulf, and prompt a response from the United States, Israel, and Iran's Arab neighbors. Negotiations are underway for Iran to stop work on its nuclear program. But even if they succeed, the missiles remain and complement Iran's ability to use its asymmetric forces to threaten the flow of world oil exports. The missiles, the nuclear program, its asymmetric capabilities all contribute to Iran's ability to pursue its larger geopolitical objectives in the region. The divided Korean Peninsula remains one of the largest sources of uncertainty and potential conflict in a prosperous and growing Asia. Unification of Korea will be one of the biggest changes to the geopolitical landscape and is seen by the world as a dark tunnel. Opacity among regional powers creates confusion. Misunderstanding impedes smart planning. False assumptions could cause costly strategic blunders. But CSIS believes the potential for growth, prosperity and peace of a united Korea is immense. How can we maximize the social, humanitarian and economic returns of a unified Korea while avoiding conflict?
Beyond Parallel is an unprecedented and comprehensive resource for bringing transparency to the many challenges and opportunities of Korean unification. Beyond Parallel investigates the broader implications of unification, but also the specific issues that Korea and the world face. These critical issues are explored through expert analysis, satellite imagery, and cutting-edge methods of data collection. Welcome to Beyond Parallel. Food and the way we eat has always been changing. From how it's grown, sourced, prepared, to the consequences on health and the ethics of what we eat. In the 20th century alone, we saw food in many different ways. And today, there are many new trends shaping what and how we eat. Six billion, seven, five, five planets. The age of electronics. This big data is an example of with money will generate money. Money. The subject to arrest. The 113th Congress. Food of the future will involve three major drivers. Availability access, and stability. Our current food production and efficiency gains sustainable. With more people, there needs to be more food. Growth of this order requires more arable land and better farming. Most importantly, it requires significantly more water. The effects of global climate change will further exacerbate today's water problems. With the presence of extreme weather, dry regions will be drier and wet regions will be wetter. Access to food is tied to wealth and location. We produce plenty of food on the planet, but not necessarily where we need it. While global hunger and poverty have declined, factors of access and utility still include food income, malnutrition, and obesity. With more people, there is more demand for finite resources. Food, water, and clean air. Food shortages, riots, and mass migration will lead to global instability. But there are opportunities for change to avoid this precipice. The world is witnessing incredible advances in food production technology. While these are in many ways considered cutting-edge ideas, not all solutions require radical forward thinking. If the developing world would adopt farming practices that were in place 50 years ago in the developed world, yields would certainly improve. Also, there is a need for continued agricultural research with an emphasis on commercialization. In addition, sources of food such as jellyfish and insects are regular staples in societies that are considered to be underdeveloped but will continue to find their way into the diets of the developed world. Distributing the food revolutions of today is a major factor in creating a more secure future. The key to ensuring food security lies in the lessons of the past, the people of the present, and the ideas of the future. Protecting the homeland is regularly identified as the top priority of U.S. missile defense efforts. This mission is dependent upon a global network of sensors and interceptors, including the ground-based Mid-Course Defense System, or GMD. The formal prioritization of homeland missile defense, however, has not always been reflected in the budget. Today's ground-based interceptors, or GBIs, were originally designed in the 1990s and to some extent still use technology from that era. Today's system is able to defend the nation from certain long-range ballistic missile threats, such as from North Korea. As missile threats grow, however, today's defenses could be outmatched unless steps are taken to improve reliability and capacity. By the end of 2017, only 44 interceptors will be deployed between Alaska and California. The site at Fort Greeley, Alaska was designed to hold up to 100 interceptors. But reliability and capability are equally important as numbers. 
The Missile Defense Agency is currently developing the redesigned kill vehicle, drawing upon advances from other recent missile defense programs. Space-based sensors and improvements for tracking and discrimination will also help. The United States should also consider other solutions, such as directed energy, transportable GBIs, or an underlay of other interceptors for key areas. Entirely new types of threats to the homeland are also emerging, including cruise missiles and boost glide vehicles, which require different solutions. None of this is easy, but continued focus will be necessary to outpace these threats. I have huge confidence in other people and a degree of confidence in myself that has sometimes helped me take those crazy risks that I took. And what accounts for that degree of confidence in yourself? Love. Love? Yeah. Yeah. You, you have, I mean, I'm sorry, this is outside the economic field yeah. <laughs> by a long way. But uh, yeah, I, I very strongly believe that you, you can, love generates confidence. If, if your parents love you, if your siblings love you, if your uh, mm -hmm. spouse, companion, whoever, or your children love you, it gives you that level of confidence that helps you move to the next step or do something else which is harder, bigger, or further. Yeah. That's very, very smart and very powerful. Wow. And While much of the world focuses on terrorism in the Middle East, violent extremist groups have expanded their ambitions and reach in Africa as well. In the Western Sahel, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb has produced or inspired a proliferation of extremist groups that continue to destabilize the region. In the areas around Lake Chad, Boko Haram, with its origins in northeast Nigeria, has left tens of thousands of civilians dead and displaced almost three million people. The security vacuum in Libya and the presence of Islamic State and Al-Qaeda deepen the risks to the Sahel region. There has been a lot of turmoil and trouble with these radical elements, which you find in this arc of instability from North Africa to Afghanistan. Military intervention by regional forces, France and the UN, have weakened these groups and reclaimed territories they once held. But the drivers of militancy and the complex social, economic, and political environment that fuels these groups remain very much intact. Unless this understructure of vulnerability and criminality is addressed, extremist violence will remain an enduring threat to the region. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, is a group so vicious and unmanageable that Al-Qaeda expelled them in February of 2014. ISIS uses the ever-expanding safe haven straddling the Iraq-Syria border to pursue a regional Sunni caliphate. Originally intent on striking the regime in Damascus, ISIS has more frequently battled an array of Syrian opposition forces who in turn suspect ISIS of colluding with President Assad. Iraqis dominate ISIS leadership, operate robust local and international funding schemes, and lead several thousand foreign fighters from more than 70 countries in their assault on Iraq's Shiite-dominated government. 
What do these dramatic developments mean for an already volatile Middle East in the wider world? The defense acquisition system has given the United States military an unmatched technological advantage for over 70 years. Along with its legendary complexity, it's brought us the Abrams tanks, the nuclear aircraft carrier, the amphibious assault vehicle, and the B-2 bomber. Today it spends more than $300 billion a year, nearly three times as much as Amazon's annual worldwide sales. Over 150,000 people and almost 2,000 pages of rules are employed to make sure that money buys what the military needs. And much like Amazon, you can find just about anything in DoD shopping cart. How hard is it to buy all that? Exhibit A, this simple 500 element flow chart that explains how the defense acquisition system works. Let's take a closer look at that framework though. There are three fundamental elements for every acquisition, a need, an appropriation, and a contract. The requirements process defines the need, which is often called a statement of work. The budget process generates the funding, and the contracting process buys the product or service from industry. This structure holds equally for all things in DoD shopping cart, from the simplest to the most complex. For the simplest things, the process can be performed by one government professional in a few days with a requisition order or need a government purchase card, or funding, and a bill of sale, or contract. For the most complex acquisitions, hundreds of people are involved in every step of the process over a period of decades. Let's apply this underlying structure to the Pentagon's most complex acquisition program, the Joint Strike Fighter, or F-35. First, the need. In 2000, the Air Force, Navy, and the Marine Corps produce a statement of work for the F-35 also known as an Operational Requirements Document. While there have been some important changes to the document, these basic requirements remain the standard against which the program is judged. Second, the contract. A year later, the DoD awarded Lockheed Martin a contract to develop the F-35 with three variants, one for each service. And while Lockheed has been awarded several F-35 related contracts, this initial contract remains in place to this day. Third, the funding. Since the decisive competition kicked off in 1997, Congress has provided 20 years of appropriations for the F-35. The estimated total budget is more than $1 trillion, which includes all the money necessary to develop, produce, and operate thousands of this aircraft for over 50 years. To date, however, only about 10% of that amount has actually been spent. In other words, the F-35 is only now moving past its initial stages. This three-part underlying structure gives us insight into what makes acquisition work better. As the F-35 illustrates, a well-understood requirement, a clear contract that aligns contractor and government interests, and a realistic budget are crucial building blocks to set early on in the process. Even as we seek new approaches to acquisition, these critical elements will continue to form the foundation of any successful acquisition system. Currently, India ranks 54th on the World Bank's Logistics Performance Index, more than 20 spots below manufacturing competitors like China and Malaysia. This is a major challenge for Modi's Make in India initiative. For example, India's truckers report that 15% to 25% of travel time is actually spent waiting at the heavily enforced state border checkpoints. They pay as much as $1.1 billion a year in bribes to state officials. The main problem is that India does not have a single national market. Its 29 states and seven union territories each have their own system of sales taxes. As a result, internal borders look more like international ones. The version of the goods and services tax sitting before parliament isn't perfect, but it will cut down on transit time for goods, paperwork for businesses, and could add one half of a percent to annual economic growth. A seamless national tax environment will help Indian commerce flow more quickly. The supercontinent of Eurasia is home to 60% of the global economy and two thirds of humanity. It's been called the geographic pivot of history. For over four centuries, Eurasia's economic focus has been the maritime passages that surround it. But during ancient times, many of the world's most important trading routes ran overland. 
today, regional powers are putting forward competing visions for reconnecting Asia. Roads, railways, and other infrastructure projects could revive overland routes. They could forge new maritime connections, and they could reshape the global economic landscape. The stakes are high. Last century's infrastructure projects fueled development, but also competition and even conflict. Today's efforts could echo well beyond the region. And the basic reality is that the division of the world into kind of totally separate autonomous entities and other areas controlled by sometimes foreigners is coming to an end. We are getting one interconnected world. But critical questions remain about these massive investments. What's driving these projects? Will they connect in an economically meaningful way? What does that foretell? What does that mean in terms of uh, political ambitions and how people will look at the region differently and will they behave in a different way? The Reconnecting Asia project provides new tools for answering these questions, beginning with what's really happening on the ground. Use this interactive website to track the evolution of Asia's infrastructure network at the project level. Explore the who, what, and why behind these megaprojects. See tomorrow's supercontinent through the eyes of regional powers. Make sense of it all with expert analysis that uncovers the trend lines behind today's headlines. This is reconnectingasia.csis.org. This century will feature a major shift in economic and geopolitical power toward Asia. China, India, and increasingly Southeast Asia have joined Japan and Korea as global stakeholders. But Asia's peaceful rise is threatened by fractious maritime disputes. Its waters are more contested than any on Earth. The South China Sea is home to the most complex disputes over water and seabed in the world. Clashes over ownership of the Paracel, Spratly and Senkaku Islands could destabilize an otherwise booming region. And from the Sea of Okhotsk to the Indian Ocean, overlapping claims prevent Asian states from accessing desperately needed offshore resources. A lack of transparency about claims and how they are being advanced has only made the region more dangerous. How can states negotiate boundary disputes if their claims are not clear? How can civilian and military ships safely navigate if they don't know where international waters lie? How can countries avoid accidental conflict if they are unsure of the disposition and intentions of their neighbours' forces? The Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative was founded on the idea that sunshine is the best disinfectant and the most efficient policeman. The initiative is a complete resource for understanding Asia's complex maritime issues. AMTI monitors reclamation, island building and construction on disputed rocks and reefs. It unpacks the web of legal and historical issues driving maritime disputes, and it seeks to draw attention to the claims being made and point out where those claims overstep international law. On this and many other fronts, transparency is desperately needed in Asia's waters. Join the dialogue. Visit us at amti.csis.org. January 17, Iraq time, marks an unrecognized milestone. The United States has been bombing that country almost continuously for a quarter of a century. What has the U.S. been trying to accomplish with all these air attacks? And what has been the effect? The air attacks have occurred in five phases. But to fully understand this history, we need to go back to the beginning of air power theory. The tactical use of air power sought to defeat enemy air attacks and to strike enemy ground forces. But the horror of World War I led some air power advocates to propose a new idea. Use air power strategically to strike at an enemy's economy, population, and political leadership, thereby winning wars without costly ground campaigns. The massive conventional air campaigns in World War II, in Korea, and in Vietnam produced many positive results. But they did not by themselves produce enemy surrender. When Desert Storm began, some in the Air Force hoped that new technologies would force Saddam 
to surrender from an air campaign alone. Others saw air power as part of a joint campaign working with ground and naval forces. And an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. Air attacks did make a major contribution to winning Desert Storm. But as was true of previous adversaries, Saddam did not surrender to air attacks alone. Iraqi civil society and Saddam's government proved to be highly resilient. After the war, Saddam used his own air power to suppress insurrections and stay in power. So the U.S. instituted no-fly zones in the north to protect the Kurds and in the south to protect the Shia. These were successful in protecting the threatened groups, but no-fly zones turned out to be major military operations. Maintaining them year after year required continuous suppression of Iraqi air defenses and periodic attacks on the Iraqi military. I take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction. The U.S. launched a new wave of air attacks during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. These attacks looked a lot like those of 1991, with two changes. The first was attacking Iraqi leadership directly, called decapitation. The second was called shock and awe, hitting a society so hard and in so many ways that it becomes disoriented and collapses. Both failed. Saddam evaded attack, and although Iraqi society suffered, Saddam did not surrender. In other areas, air power again made major contributions. During the long Iraqi insurgency, air power played a useful but secondary role because insurgencies produced only a few and then very fleeting targets. Many air missions were taken over by UAVs. Their patience and precision matched the nature of counterinsurgency. Over the years, a conventional wisdom has arisen about the use of air power. Decapitation is hard to do, but can sometimes be successful if there is a small group of charismatic enemy leaders. Strategic air attack can cause a lot of destruction, but its ability to win wars on its own is unproven. Battlefield support can be very effective, but it needs a viable ground force, US, allied, or local, to win battles. In 2014, President Obama pledged to disrupt and ultimately destroy ISIS. To do this, the U.S. appears to be using air power in all three ways. Results so far are again mixed. We've killed several ISIS leaders, but others have replaced them. We've killed a lot of enemy fighters, but so far ISIS has been able to replace them, though with some strain. We provided air support to the Iraqi and the local ground forces with some success, but the rollback of ISIS's territorial gains still has a long way to go. What will the next 25 years bring? Air attacks have become a central element of U.S. involvement in Iraq and the broader Middle East. When we are changing regimes, we attack governments and civil society. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic region, and we could not be more delighted to welcome uh, Secretary of State for Defense, Michael Fallon, here to CSIS. I was explaining to the Secretary, boy, the, the news cycle has been so quiet and so slow the last few days that uh, we were so glad he could come here and help uh, elevate uh, our discussion, but uh, he comes at an incredibly important time, uh, certainly on the heels of several days of incredible news, not only uh, security-related issues, whether that was the North Korean launch of uh, an ICBM, uh, but also as we watch unfold the historic meeting between President Trump and President Putin uh, today. Secretary Fallon, thankfully, is a frequent visitor to CSIS. He was here two years ago in March, and the topic of the discussion was in defense of a rules-based order, how that transatlantic relationship can be used. And I think now, in today's discussion, we will again look at the defense of the rules-based order and see where we go from here. Secretary Fallon uh, assumed uh, Secretary of State uh, for Defense his position on July 15, 2014. Two days later, a Russian Buke missile shot down MH17. That was his first few days on the job. Three years later, two elections later, one referendum later, Secretary Fallon, you've had an extraordinary tenure already in your three years. We are delighted that you are here with us. We have so much to discuss, and we look forward to your comments. Colleagues, please join me in thanking and welcoming Secretary Fallon to CSIS.
Heather, thank you, and good afternoon. It's great to be back in the United States and to be speaking at this world-renowned center whose ideas have influenced generations of defense thinkers on both sides of the pond. This is my first opportunity to visit the United States after our recent election. And let me reassure you that post-election, our government remains strong and we remain committed to delivering stronger defense. Now, there are some who've taken a, a look at Britain in the past few months after an unpredictable election. I'm not sure there's another kind of election these days. Uh, have looked at the negotiations over Brexit, have seen the series of appalling terrorist incidents in Manchester and, and London, and have wondered whether Britain is getting distracted in any way from our international role. That wouldn't be the first time our critics have been wrong. I remember that first visit as Defence Secretary back in 2015. That was before rather than after the general election of that year. Yet some of the concerns expressed were all too familiar. They said we weren't committed to the 2%. They noted Parliament's refusal to endorse strikes against Assad's chemical weapons. They said we wouldn't be committing to two aircraft carriers. They said we wouldn't act in the face of trouble. So it's worth reminding ourselves just what happened next. First, we did invest. Later that year, 2015, we conducted an ambitious strategic defense and security review, committing to continue to meet NATO's 2% target. Since then, not only have we done what we said we would do, but we've also chosen to grow our defense budget year on year by at least 0.5% ahead of inflation. NATO figures published last week confirmed that we are spending, we are spending more than 2% and we are also meeting the target to spend 20% of that on new equipment. We're using that growing budget to purchase, to develop and to build a raft of high-end kit, from P-8 aircraft and drones to Apache helicopters and armored vehicles, from fifth generation F-35 fighters to two aircraft carriers, the most powerful ships ever built in Britain. And we were delighted uh, two weeks ago to witness HM Queen Elizabeth embark for the first time on her sea trials. Our carrier strike plans, thanks to your continuing support, and we have over 120 aircrew and pilots training here on 10 F-35 aircraft, those carrier strike plans are already becoming a reality. We're building, following a successful vote in Parliament, we are building a new generation of nuclear ballistic submarines to maintain our ultimate nuclear deterrent. And we are adapting to an age of information warfare, investing in equipment with the sensors and receptors to handle a superabundance of information, transforming our military structures to cope with the virtual environment, bringing our signals and intelligence corps together under a shared command to collate, to analyze, to disseminate cyber information more efficiently and effectively, and training up a new generation of cyber warriors to strengthen our networks and tackle our vulnerabilities. My second point today is that we're doing more than investing. We are also acting. When I spoke here in March 2015, that was still under the shadow of that 2013 Syria vote against taking military action to deal with the use of chemical weapons. Yet by the end of 15, the new parliament had voted overwhelmingly to extend the airstrikes we were conducting in Iraq to Syria itself. 
and today we're performing a pivotal role in the 71-member Counter-Dash Global Coalition, attacking Dash positions with our aircraft, training local forces. We've trained over 50,000 Iraqi and Peshmerga troops, using our offensive cyber capabilities to disrupt Dash activity in both Iraq and in Syria, and an overall contribution of airstrikes second only to that of the United States. It's striking to think that when I took office just three years ago, Daesh were closing in on the gates to Baghdad. Today, they are close to feet, to defeat in their last city of Mosul. But the counter Daesh campaign is far from the United Kingdom's only operation. We've been going global. We're not just in the Middle East. We continue in Afghanistan, where we've committed to increasing troop numbers again after the uplift we announced last summer, building counterterrorism capacity, improving the resilience of Afghan forces, strengthening the Afghan Air Force, training the next generation of Afghan officers. We're in Africa too, training Somalians to fight al-Shabaab, assisting South Sudan in the midst of an appalling humanitarian crisis. In total, this afternoon, we have more than 10,000 British service men and women deployed or in bases and involved in some 25 operations around the globe. So Britain has delivered, Britain is delivering, and we will continue to do so. But my third point is that we will do so in partnership. We are stronger, of course, when we work together. And the fact is today that our nations are facing a wave of multiple, concurrent, diverse, global threats from Islamist extremism, from North Korea testing missiles, and as we've seen, firing off missiles, from Russia more aggressive, as we've seen in Ukraine and Syria, from Iran sponsoring terror, from the insidious spread of misinformation and cyber attacks. These are challenges that demand an international response. So as we deliver on our domestic vote to leave the political framework that is the European Union, we see Brexit as an opportunity not to step back from European defense, but to step up to strengthen Euro-Atlantic security. In particular, we are strengthening our bonds within NATO, the cornerstone of our defense, continuing to deter in the light of Russian aggression. We are leading NATO's enhanced forward presence in Estonia with 800 British troops. We are working alongside the United States enhanced forward presence in Poland. This year, Britain leads the alliance's very high readiness joint task force. This year, I have dispatched RAF typhoons to Romania for southern area policing to police the skies over the Black Sea. This month, Royal Navy ships take over for a year half of NATO's maritime missions in the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and the Aegean. We're also in NATO right behind the United States in calling for all members to start paying their way. Your president was absolutely correct to say that European nations need to do more to shoulder their share of the burden. Since Britain and the United States stood together to demand action back at the Wales summit, 24 of the 29 member nations have now raised their game, and the alliance has cumulatively increased its defense spending by around $46 billion. But money isn't the only NATO issue. Forged in a monochrome world of the Cold War, NATO must now transform itself 
into a far more agile organization. Secretary Mattis and I are working together for faster decision making, better prioritization, and less bureaucracy in the way that NATO works. We also want to see NATO adopting a 360 degree approach, producing a coherent force capable of meaningful action with a modern integrated approach to defense and to deterrence, playing an enhanced role in the fight against international terror. Now our global influence as a country doesn't just come from NATO. It comes also from a wealth of bilateral alliances. Last week, we took a significant step forward by expanding the UK-led Joint Expeditionary Force to include Sweden and Finland. That gives us a nine-nation armed force of like-minded Northern European countries able to deploy a force of up to 10,000 personnel. Augmenting our ability to respond to threats in the North Sea and the North Atlantic, but also giving us the adaptability and agility to deploy very quickly to humanitarian tasks, to rescue our citizens from crisis hotspots, to conduct more minor military missions. And we've recently used our purchase of your P8s to do more trilaterally with the United States and with Norway. Last week, I signed an agreement with Secretary Mattis and our Norwegian uh, colleague to enable closer cooperation on the training and logistics and support of those P8s that need to address the change security environment and increase Russian submarine activity in the North Atlantic. Now, it should go without saying that when it comes to bilateral relationships, the United States remains our strongest ally. Since I spoke here back in 2015, our partnership has only strengthened further. I've already touched on the operations across the world, from Europe to the Middle East, to Africa and Afghanistan. But the truth is that we are now more integrated at every level, working in each other's headquarters, flying in each other's uh, planes, training on each other's ships, collaborating on everything from nuclear capabilities, including sharing a common missile compartment and intelligence to autonomy. And we have the prospect now of United States F-35 fighters flying from the decks of our, F our aircraft carriers and our planes in turn flying from yours. Back in 2015, the United States helped support our strategic defense review. And today, as you turn to your own national defense strategy, I would like to share just one conclusion drawn from that experience of working together on our defense review. And that is the need for a stronger, modern deterrence. Last year saw the passing of the Nobel Prize winning economist Thomas Schelling, a great American who helped codify our current notions of deterrence. Were he with us today, he would doubtless remind us that deterrence is about much more than the atom bomb or the hydrogen bomb. It's about ensuring that our adversaries always know that the cost of an attack will be far greater than any potential reward. In the Cold War, that meant massing armies along the borders of the Iron Curtain whilst building up vast nuclear arsenals. Yet in an age of gray zone conflict with proxy, non-conventional threats, sometimes anonymous, often amorphous, adding to the conventional and nuclear dangers and threatening to undermine the rules-based international order on which our security depends, our deterrence must necessarily evolve. Agility will be critical. It will demand constant strategic planning to prepare for a broader range of threats, 
It will require perpetual persistence to continually countering cyber intrusion, to rebut the malicious misinformation of our adversaries with a faster truth. It will seek new innovations in disruptive capabilities, whether big data or autonomous systems, to stay ahead of the curve. Above all, it will be about the art of persuasion. Last week, I spoke at the Margaret Thatcher Security Conference in London. Its theme was whether or not we are witnessing the decline and fall of the West, whether our Western values were up to overcoming these new and present dangers. I argued then that not only can we rise to this challenge, but that we must and that we will. We're not being attacked by these adversaries because we've failed, because our values are redundant. On the contrary, we're being attacked because we won, because we succeeded in spreading these values and beliefs across the world. And today, we are recovering our confidence in them. But in an age of contested interests and confrontation, always pray to doubters, where our adversaries seek to use social media, cyber warfare, and misinformation to rewrite the Western narrative, to extend their spheres of influence, to try to limit those freedoms that we championed. We have to learn how to remake those original arguments. Because in so doing, that will make our societies far more resilient, far less susceptible to the sophistry of our foes. Now, that requires political leadership. And no two nations are better equipped to make the case for the West than the United States and the United Kingdom. We share the same values of democracy, of justice, of freedom, of tolerance, values we fought for throughout the past century. But we didn't just fight. We also championed the causes of liberty, the free market, the innovation that technology demands. We gave people ever greater opportunity to live wealthier, healthier, happier, freer lives. So if we get this right, if we present our case strongly enough again, we will do more than simply build resilience in our countries. We can re reawaken the hopes of those still living under oppressive regimes. In the 1980s, President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher succeeded in shattering the shackles of communism not just because they railed against the cruel and desolate creeds that lurked behind the Iron Curtain, but because they presented the vision of a better life. I remember a few years back being struck by Sharansky's description of what he called that beautiful moment when news of Reagan's evil empire speech reached Siberia. It was, he wrote, the brightest, most glorious day Finally, a spade had been called a spade. Finally, Orwell's new speak was dead. President Reagan had from that moment made it impossible for anyone in the West to continue closing their eyes to the real nature of the Soviet Union. So today, it's not enough just to speak out against the aggressive behavior of Russia in Ukraine or in Syria or to urge our adversaries to act in accordance with international law. We must also give hope to people across the world of a better way of life. Secretary Jap Mattis, my friend, said in Germany last week, mar marking the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, he said, we stand for freedom and we will never surrender the freedom of our people. Back in 1996, the Iron Lady delivered a speech in Fulton, Missouri, where, of course, Churchill had coined the Iron Curtain phrase 50 years before. And she said, and I quote, 
There are rare moments when history is open and its course changed by means such as these. We may be at just such a moment now. I suggest to you this afternoon that we have reached such a moment. Once more, we look to the United States to recapture the spirit of Fulton, to provide deterrence for a darker age, to remake the case for the West, and to follow the mission statement of this very center in, I quote, sustaining American prominence and prosperity as a force for good in the world. And as you do that, I want you to rest assured that a bolder global Britain, as in the Great War, as in the Second World War, as in the Cold War, will continue standing by your side, strengthening our transatlantic bonds, and supporting everywhere the course of freedom. Thank you. Secretary Fallon, thank you. Uh, sometimes we need a dose of inspiration, and uh, we needed that. Thank you very, very much. In some ways, I think the, the challenge right now of any think tank is where to begin, what subject do we, do we jump into? Um, I think I'm going to start with the subject of the day, and that is Russia. Sure. Uh, and uh, President Trump uh, stated in his speech in Warsaw on Thursday about the bedrock nature of the Article 5 commitment, uh, something that was not accomplished at the NATO leaders meeting in Brussels. You've just recently uh, completed a successful NATO defense ministerial. Help us understand. Um, how things are going with the deployment of the NATO battalions. NATO has had a challenge of deployment, getting them, getting forces there quickly, getting the kit there, getting the, the pre-positioned equipment. What has your uh, experience been and, and the, the, the British forces experience in Estonia in preparation for the placement of a battalion to defend Estonia should that become necessary? Well, we've, we've seen a resurgence of NATO. We've seen a revival of NATO right back from the summit in Wales in 2014. We've seen, as I've said, a number of NATO members now begin to increase their defense spending again after some years of decline. And uh, we've seen uh, more and more of them now start to commit to a date to reach the 2% target. And uh, your president's rhetoric has, has only been helpful in that. I mean, it has helped to... Uh, um, encourage those other allies to be clearer about their defense spending. But we've also, since that same summit, seen uh, a revival in NATO's seriousness about deployment, exactly your point. We saw commitment then to the Very High Readiness Task Force. That stood up last year. We command it this year. Uh, I was there on exercise with them in Romania, exercise noble jump, and we saw several thousand troops um, from um, my country, your country, but also from Spain, from uh, um, a whole series of uh, some of the newer members of NATO detachments uh, deploying. And that is the major response force, if you like, the fire brigade of NATO, ready to deploy. We agreed in Warsaw just a year ago on enhanced forward presence. And within a year, and this I think would have been unthinkable in the NATO of five or ten years ago, Within a year, we've seen um, all four battle groups deployed in the three Baltic states and in Poland. And we've seen a number of member states of NATO come together in different detachments, fitting in alongside each other. We have a company of, a uh, large company of French troops alongside our battle group. And indeed, we've put a company into your battle group in, uh, in Poland. And we've seen these different formations, all of which I think has added to the collective sense of purpose uh, in NATO. And it was quite an emotional moment standing there uh, in Tapa in Estonia for the stand-up parade of the British and French troops when the president of Estonia said to me, this is the first time we've had foreign troops on Estonian soil as friends. Uh, well, that was quite a moment and showed you just how important these deployments are 
for the eastern flank of NATO. But I find them encouraging for those of us who've always believed in NATO, that NATO has begun to revive itself. Now, we need to carry that through with the modernization reforms I, I mentioned that uh, Secretary Mattis and I are championing, which would lead to faster decision making and uh, a reduced uh, bureaucracy. But there can be no doubting now in Moscow that NATO is an organization that is uh, uh, ready to defend itself. We're watching very closely. Uh, Russia will uh, implement a very significant military exercise, uh, Zapad, every four years. Uh, this major exercise comes to the Western Military District. Some believe uh, a combination of over 100,000 forces will be deployed from the Kola Peninsula uh, along uh, NATO's uh, eastern flank. Any particular concerns you have? What are you watching for as we watch this major exercise unfold in the well, we'll, September. Uh, thank you. We'll be watching Zapad 17 extremely closely. These are exercises, these are much larger exercises than anything that NATO can uh, carry out. And, and in that sense, they are more provocative than any NATO deployment. We've been absolutely transparent with Russia about our deployments, uh, the numbers involved, the armaments they carry, the purpose of these deployments, which is, uh, is absolutely defensive. It's their aim to reassure uh, they are defensive deployments. And that is uh, you know, a rather different approach to what we see uh, with Zapad. But uh, as uh, Moscow conducts that exercise with its troops and its troops from, and troops from Belarusia, um, there should be no doubt that uh, you know, NATO, NATO has demonstrated through its enhanced forward presence and the uh, Very High Readiness Task Force has demonstrated its willingness to uh, back up its support and uh, to have the President reconfirm the United States' commitment to Article 5 yesterday was, was the icing on top. I want to turn a little bit uh, closer to shore, uh, and I'm so glad you mentioned about the cooperation both bilaterally and then trilaterally with the uh, Maritime Patrol aircraft. There's a growing concern about Russian anti-submarine warfare activity in the North Atlantic, specifically. Uh, think tanks here in Washington are holding uh, tabletop exercises on the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. We haven't done that in a very long time. Uh, we've written a report recently that said we really need to beef up NATO's uh, command structure. Uh, MARCOM, uh, there's much more of a UK leadership role in anti-submarine warfare. What are your thoughts on that? You've actually had some back and forth with uh, Russian Defense Ministry officials about the status of aircraft carriers, both theirs and the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, you might want to reflect on that a bit, please. Well, we've seen a bit of carrier envy, I think. Only carrier to, only to be, envy, OK. Uh, only, only to be expected when you sail uh, you know, a new 65,000 ton aircraft carrier. And by the way, we're building two of them. There are only three other countries in the world building aircraft carriers at the moment. Um, but what we've seen you know, uh, in, in recent years is a significant increase in Russian submarine activity in, in the North Sea. And we need as an alliance, as well as, uh, as well as ourselves, we need to respond to that to protect our nuclear deterrent, um, to protect our carriers, uh, but also to protect NATO. Uh, and again, I alluded to the need for NATO to look three at its, to take a 360 degree view of its security. There's been an intense focus on the northeastern flank of NATO, where allies like Estonia feel particularly vulnerable. Uh, there's been concern in the southeast quadrant too, um, but it's you know it's also right we look right round NATO, and that we work more closely together. And the fact that Norway, Britain, and uh, the United States are operating the same aircraft gives us huge potential for more collaboration. Uh, in training, in logistics, in support. Already our air crew are flying, uh, are training up on, on your P-8s, and uh, we look forward to the first deployment of our, the first arrival of our P-8s uh, towards the end of this decade in, in Lossiemouth in Scotland. I'm going to finish up the Russia question uh, by noting, as you are uh, uh, doing your deployments in the Black Sea, 
we've, U.S. Uh, vessels as well as aircraft have experienced some very, as our military officials would say, unprofessional behavior by Russian pilots uh, coming within five feet of U.S. aircraft, buzzing the USS Donald Cook in the Black Sea. Any special concerns you have as you increase your maritime presence in the Black Sea and, of course, your, your air, air patrol role? Anything you're particularly concerned about uh, Russian behavior? Well, we are concerned about uh, Russian long-range aviation, where we're not notified of flights to the edge of our air, air information uh, region, where Russian aircraft don't respond when we send up uh, our jets to uh, warn them off. Um, that is uh, provocative. Uh, it can be dangerous. It often involves the diversion of civilian flights that might happen to be in the area. And there's a capacity always for uh, for misunderstanding and miscalculation. So uh, we continue to talk to Russia about that. We, we use our, our communication with Russia specifically to ensure that where possible we can uh, deconflict and where possible we can very readily de-escalate any tension that arises. Moving towards the Middle East, um, you're also the maritime mission will also be in the Aegean and the Mediterranean, as you uh, imagined. The migration crisis, uh, the the reports over the last several weeks, we're really seeing an uptick in, in migrants uh, attempting an incredibly dangerous crossing of the central Mediterranean. Um, what's the US, UK's position on, on, on the migration crisis, your naval role, the NATO and the European Union, uh, obviously the European Union taking a leadership role. What is the maritime strategy uh, here and, and where, again, a strong UK role in that, in that position? Well, it's a good example of where Britain remains and will remain. Uh, involved in the security of what is our continent. It is the security of Europe matters to us as much as to members of the European Union. Since the beginning of the e European Union mission, there are two missions as you know, the European Union mission in the central Mediterranean and the NATO mission in the Aegean. Uh, since the beginning of the European Union mission in the central Mediterranean, we've had a Royal Navy ship there and we have a Royal Navy ship there uh, today helping to save lives in the Mediterranean. Now, we're seeing um, a huge increase in the number of migrants who are uh, tackling this journey, and um, we do need to do something about this, not simply to uh, control migration into Europe, but frankly also to save lives. There are far too many setting out on what is an incredibly dangerous journey, and people are, uh, there are people making a lot of money out of this particular trade. So as well as uh, saving lives, we think it important to start to tackle the, the business model of the people smugglers to make sure they cannot profit any longer from this trade. And that means working with the Libyan authorities to uh, build up their Coast Guard effort, which is very slow work, but necessary work if, we're to police the, if they are to police their own territorial waters to stop uh, migrant boats getting to the edge of those waters where it becomes even more dangerous to attempt the journey across to uh, India to work w with Libya and to work on a policy of returns for those who are clearly not refugees, who are um, uh, clearly economic migrants that uh, are attempting to cross illegally uh, so that they can be returned properly to where they came from. So turning more uh, to Syria, we're hearing some early reports from the G20 conversations that uh, Syria looking at potential ceasefires. We have talked a lot about ceasefires. Um, what's your sense of where, where things are going in Syria? There's been some discussion about these uh, safety zones. Uh, the military footprint for that is daunting. Two uh, major powers, the United States and Russia, are in very close proximity to each other. Give us your sense of, of Syria right now. What is the future military picture look like? Well, the recent history of the Syrian civil war is littered with ceasefires. And it would be nice, you know, one day to have a ceasefire. Uh, none of these have turned out to be ceasefires. Uh, they've been uh, broken uh, persistently and broken by, by the regime and indeed broken by Russian activity itself. So, you know, we welcome any ceasefire, but uh, let's see it, let's see the results uh, on the ground. Where these uh, safety zones are proposed, you know, let's not uh, have the civilian population misled. If they can be properly enforced, then they are thoroughly welcome. We can then get in the United Nations humanitarian aid that uh, was promised. 
So far as um, de deconfliction is concerned, uh, yes, we have the, through the coalition and through the United States, we have the deconfliction machinery uh, that enables uh, uh, both the coalition and Russia and the regime to avoid flying aircraft at the same time in exactly the same space. And it's important, you know, we continue to, to work that machinery. But the battle space, particularly in North Syria, and to some extent down in the Southwest, is getting incredibly complex. And again, the capacity for miscalculation, we've already seen, sadly, around Atanf. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to work even harder at that. This is an unfair question, but hypothetically, uh, if the Syrian regime would, would use chemical weapons, would the United Kingdom be prepared to assist militarily in an attack? Well, we made it very clear last time, I made it clear to Secretary Mattis when we reviewed the various options that uh, your administration was considering just prior to the last attack, I made it very clear that the United Kingdom would support that attack. Uh, and we did support that attack uh, publicly. The use of chemical weapons is illegal, it's, it's barbaric, and uh, you know, in, innocent lives were lost. And we are in no doubt that the source of the original chemical weapons attack was the regime. It was only regime aircraft that were in the air at that uh, particular time. So uh, any effort to, uh, uh, to deal with that or to forestall a chemi further chemical weapons attack will have the United Kingdom's full support. I'm going to keep spinning my globe, and now I'm going to move to Afghanistan. Ten years from now, as you're explaining to your children and grandchildren what the role of, of the British military forces were in Afghanistan and what it accomplished, what would that story be? Well, our role was twofold. It was first to reduce the threat of uh, these transnational terror groups operating from Afghanistan, using it as a safe base to attack the West. It was to reduce and then to eliminate that particular threat. It was also to try and build a better future for the people of Afghanistan, um, where we now have a very a democracy, a fragile democracy, but a democracy nonetheless, in which I think uh, six or seven million people voted in the last uh, election, in which girls are able to be educated in school, in which uh, a, uh, uh, there has been a, an increase in the quality of life in large parts of Afghanistan. So looking back, you know, our, our, our objectives uh, were noble, to reduce the terror threat and to try and build a better Afghanistan for its own people. Now that campaign, that effort has been far longer than anybody originally foresaw. Um, I concede that. Um, and in the end, of course, it is a battle against uh, insurgency that can only be won in the end by local forces that can command the support of the local population. So I hope uh, you know, over the next uh, uh, few years, we will continue to improve the resilience of those forces. Um, that is why we are uplifting our commitment again, having uplifted again previously last year, um, to strengthen the training of Afghan forces, to improve the Air Force, to improve their uh, counterterrorism effort uh, and, uh, and future officer training. Um, it's, I think for, for many of us, as, as we're watching uh, the story unfold in Afghanistan, seeing an uptick in Russian support to the Taliban, uh, additional regional powers playing a role. In some ways, the last few years, it feels like we have lost ground. Secretary Mattis has uh, called and, and General Nicholson have called for additional forces. Do you think NATO will be able to substantially increase its contribution or its trainers, it's, it's going to be a limited footprint? It feels like we need an additional, dare I say the word, surge, um, but it just doesn't feel as if we want to make that commitment again. Well, we're past the, the danger point of last summer where the previous administration here was, was considering reducing uh, the commitment to uh, Afghan. And uh, we've seen a number of allies now looking at how they too might uplift their commitment. I think in the West, you know, we understand that um, these terror groups are still there. There is still a threat uh, to the West from their operations in, uh, in Afghanistan. I think we also understand that if Afghanistan uh, were to start to collapse as a country, there would be huge implications in terms of migration further further westwards, which, which would eventually end up with us in, in uh, Western Europe. So I hope we can continue to persuade our NATO allies to uh, increase their commitments again. 
on the basis of driving up, reinforcing the resilience of the Afghan forces themselves. In the end, this is a battle they have to win. They've been up against it in the last two or three fighting seasons since uh, we withdrew from combat operations. Um, but it's important they do win through in the end. Well, the last spin of my globe, and then I want to turn to the audience. Uh, let's turn to the Asia Pacific region. Uh, uh, mentioning North Korea, uh, before we came out here, we were hypothetically saying, you know, um, the United States, I suppose, could ask for an Article 5 commitment if a North Korean ICBM attempted to reach U.S. soil. Would NATO be able to respond in any meaningful way? We've seen where at least six NATO countries have participated in RIMPAC exercises, the UK, of course, participating in that. But really, Europe does not have a physical presence and a capability. Is there a, a, a solution set that our NATO allies can support us in trying to deter uh, North Korean advances in their ICBM capabilities? Well, first of all, we're a long way away from uh, military, op from looking at uh, military options. Um, I think we have to recognize, first of all, this is not just a threat to the United States, nor should the United States be expected to deal with this entirely on its own. This is a threat to the international community, to the region, but to the community as a whole. And it is up to the international community now to redouble its efforts to uh, get to improve uh, the cost to the regime. Uh, of what it is doing. And that means looking at the existing uh, diplomatic efforts, the resolutions that have been passed to the United Nations, ensuring they're being enforced properly, adding where necessary new names, new organizations to the list, where we have evidence that sanctions are being breached, and working harder uh, collectively to ensure that um, the international community is at one in, in dealing with this particular problem. It's a huge challenge. So now let's turn to our audience, which I ran through my questions. I know they have theirs. Uh, we have uh, colleagues with microphones. If you could please raise your hand, introduce yourself, uh, and ask your question very briefly. We're going to collect a few questions uh, and then have the uh, secretary respond to them in the remaining time. So I think we'll just start to this way. So Max, right here, sir, please. Hi, Kevin Wensing uh, with the Navy League. Uh, quick question on Qatar. Uh, did you discuss Qatar and how that influences U.S. and U.K. relations with the uh, other Arab countries, you know, having the embargo on Qatar? Thank you so much. We'll keep moving across, sir, right there. A microphone is coming your way. Thank you, Secretary, for your speech. Um, Jonathan Ward, University of Oxford. I wanted to ask if you could comment further on the scope or potential scope of US-UK defense cooperation in Asia, not just on North Korea, but as the whole region sort of changes. And also if you could comment. US-UK uh, defense cooperation in Asia, if I understand. You have to speak very okay. clearly into that, sorry. Right. I just have it a little hard to In type Asia in. as a whole and also potentially in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. Also curious about um, if you could comment on UK-India um, defense cooperation and, and the potential for that going forward, particularly in the maritime and air domains. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll just take two more questions here and then I'll come back around for a second round. Right in the back there, please, Donna. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Ty with at and um, Just uh, with the increase in cyber attack from adversaries and with your military presence across the world, can you further discuss the UK strategy on how to increase the security defense of your communication network? Okay, I want to make sure I understand. It's Again, just a UK strategy uh, in... The British uh, strategy on cyber? Yeah. Okay, uh, is there a more specific on offensive capabilities? More defensive. Defensive. Thank you. And sir, there's one more right there. Right, sorry, uh, the gentleman behind, and then sir, I'll, I promise I'll get you the next round. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Smith of The Guardian. Um, Secretary Tillerson says that in the meeting um, today between President Trump and Putin that uh, President Trump did press a couple of times, well, several times on the issue of uh, Russia's interference in last year's election. and. President Putin um, consistently denied it. I'm just interested in your reaction to that and, and more generally whether you have confidence in, in this uh, American administration to um, take a tough line on, Putin, on Vladimir Putin. So I'll just, we'll stop there for a moment. So uh, the uh, 
challenging issue between the, sure. the GCC and Qatar, sure. India, uh, cyber, sure. and yeah. anything else you'd like to offer on okay, the I'll meeting? Okay, I'll do my best. I didn't quite get the detail of some of the questions because of them. I think it's the way the microphone worked. On Qatar, yes, I mean, we want to see this uh, dispute uh, brought to an end. Secretary Tillerson is working extremely hard uh, to do that, to bring that about as a kind of honest broker. He's working in close uh, uh, cooperation with uh, our Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. And uh, I hope this dispute, as all disputes, I hope in the, you know, we can bring it to a resolution. Um, uh, we have friends right across the Gulf. Uh, this is a, a, dis a dispute in the family, if you like, in the Gulf. Um, and uh, you know, we want to see it uh, brought to an end. And we're using all our contacts to uh, try and uh, explore various ways of doing that. But the lead is with, uh, is with Secretary Tillerson. On, uh, on Asia, um, we, we are committed uh, on the South China Sea, for example, to exercising the uh, right to freedom of navigation and to fly. We have flown uh, typhoons through the South China Sea last October. We've flown an A400M through the South China Sea, and we think it's very important that uh, we stick to that principle. We continue to work to revive uh, the uh, Five Powers defense arrangement uh, to the South to uh, give more reassurance to uh, members of the Five Powers through regular ex exercising. And I think you specifically mentioned uh, India. Uh, I was in India uh, in uh, uh, April, just before the uh, general election. We're working more closely with India on a number of uh, defense uh, programs, indeed on, uh, on a number of uh, projects where we hope to sell jointly into third markets. Um, we're working closely with India on. And there is growing cooperation between uh, our two navies in particular. Um, as well as between our, our armies and air forces. So it's a, uh, it's, um, a bilateral cooperation we're investing in uh, very heavily. On cyber, we identified cyber as one of the uh, three or four major threats to our country back in the uh, 2015 SDSR. We think we were right to do so. We earmarked some 1.9 billion sterling to spend over the, um, over the uh, spending period on improving our cyber defenses defending our own defense, improving the resilience of our critical national infrastructure, and also defending, uh, also uh, building up the offensive cyber capabilities that uh, we have already confirmed that we are now employing um, to the, uh, with the coalition against Daesh, and which I have very recently confirmed we would be willing to put at the service of NATO if those capabilities uh, were required. On um, uh, the, the meeting between Putin and, um, and uh, the President, I haven't seen the readout that you seem to have already, you've already got from Secretary Tillerson. I uh, haven't seen that. I have drawn attention in my speech on Russia at St. Andrews University to uh, uh, undoubted uh, Russian interference in, West, in European elections, in the, referendum, in the Netherlands referendum, in the French election, uh, the attempted coup in Montenegro. I'm not going to comment, sadly. Um, I'm not going to comment on, uh, uh, on uh, interference in, in the United States election. Great. I think we have a second round here, and we'll take the cluster of three questions here, and then I'll, I'll loop back around. Sir, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, Pete Shutley, I'm retired from the State Department, and my question is cyber. Has the British government made a decision on what would be the line that would trigger an Article 5 NATO response. Now, I'm not expecting you to say clearly, yes, this is the line, but maybe you could give us some examples of points below that line and maybe some points clearly above it so that we can get a better idea of what level of cyber attack would trigger Article 5. Thank you, sir. And we'll just pass that microphone right there to the second row. Yep, and then to me, sir. Uh, hi, Atarv Gupta. Um, my question is regarding the UK efforts in Mosul and Iraq. Um, f after the push of ISIS out of the area, what are the UK's efforts in strengthening the Iraqi government to prevent another power vacuum in the future? Thank you. Marisa. Yes, uh, Marisa Lino with Northrop Grumman. Uh, with so much going on uh, between our two countries and in the world, 
is there any issue between on the subject of US UK defense trade that has come up uh, to the table between yourself and your US counterpart thank you thank you I'll stop there and then we'll take Let's another stop final there <laughs> on um, on cyber yes I've been asked this question before I mean first of all we've got uh, NATO to agree now as allies that um, uh, a cyber attack you know, can be construed as an attack under Article 5. I think that's important um, that we recognize cyber as a domain alongside the other domains. However, I don't think it's useful to start specifying specific thresholds. I think the danger is if we did that, we'd start to see cyber attacks just below the threshold that we have identified. And I would rather our adversaries were left uh, uncertain as to exactly what they qualifying level of pain is, if you like, before Article 5 would be triggered. On, um, on Mosul, uh, yes, I mean, we, we want to be sure uh, at the end of pushing Daesh out of Iraq, out of uh, uh, Talafar and Hawija and the remaining cities of the middle Euphrates River Valley, if we can get them completely out of Iraq, we want to be very sure we don't have to go back in there and do this as a coalition all over again. You know, 71 countries, an investment over three years, um, a huge um, uh, investment for us of uh, RAF uh, strike power, of intelligence gathering and training. I said over 50,000 Iraqi troops uh, trained. So what's really important is that it's not simply, we don't just simply get the humanitarian aid in as it's got into uh, East Mosul where uh, the essential services are being restored, schools are being reopened, markets are starting to open again, but that um, there is sufficient stabilization that the Sunni populations of these cities in Nineveh province and Ambar really feel they have a stake in the future of Iraq. So this requires stabilization and political reconciliation, and we need to strengthen the, you know, the Abadi government's determination to follow through the military campaign with that political work that should, uh, in the end, prevent us having to do this all over again. Uh, UK-US uh, relationship, uh, um, there is um, huge investment as a result of our SDSR in American uh, kit, if I can put it as crudely as that. Uh, we also therefore expect to see our own companies further down the supply chain, um, you know, getting a sufficient uh, share of that We've signed an agreement recently with Boeing, which is seeing them invest more in the United Kingdom and opening up more opportunity for our SMEs uh, in particular. And um, you know, we want this to be two-way traffic. We are buying a lot of high-end American kit, F-35s uh, from you, I think, um, Apache, uh, attack helicopters, um, the P-8 aircraft and so on. And we expect uh, you know, a fair return from that. And we're also watching very closely, there's no secret about that, any tendency towards protectionism that might discriminate against uh, British companies in particular. Indeed, British companies involved in the United States defense chain as well. So these are issues that uh, we discuss with the administration. Fantastic. I think we have really a very short time for two quick questions, sir. I'm going to take the two right there, and then we will, uh, we will uh, close out. Sir. Hello, it's Gary O'Donoghue, BBC News. You talked a lot about um, military to military cooperation and um, the kit, as you put it. But um, have you had a chance since you've been here to express the UK government's displeasure about the leaks of intelligence, particularly around the time of the Manchester bombing and the damage that that could do to trust between the IC communities here and um, in London? Thank you, Mr. Admiral will take your question. I'm Rear Admiral Thomas Ernst, German Defense Attaché here in Washington. Mr. Secretary, re very recently, a former Chief of Defense, uh, General Lord Dennett, voiced his concern uh, because of those high ticket items like carriers and a nuclear component that there might be a moment one might be forced to reduce the army, the British army, from 80,000 to up to 65,000. Do you share this concern? Fine, those, those two final questions. Uh, Gary first, good to see you again, Gary. Um, so far as um, the intelligence leaks are concerned, yes, these were serious leaks at the beginning of a criminal investigation. Uh, we made that very clear to the United States. We've received uh, 
um, reassurance from those, uh, uh, I think the particular agency are concerned that uh, this information where it is shared will be properly protected in future and we now regard that particular matter as closed uh, and it's important that it is um, closed off because there is a huge amount of intelligence sharing uh, that is necessary when you're fighting uh, terrorism. So it was unfortunate um, but it's been dealt with. So far as uh, Lord Dannard's remarks are concerned, he's a former head of the army, um, I can reassure you we have no plan to reduce the size of the army down to uh, uh, 65,000. On the contrary, our manifesto commitment is to maintain the size of the armed forces, including the ability of the army to fight at uh, divisional level. And indeed, in the 2015 SDSR, we are increasing um, the size of the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. So we're not about cutting the, uh, uh, the army. Well, Secretary, thank you so much. This has been a rich and substantive discussion, and it's just a perfect reflection of the rich, deep, and abiding relationship that we have with the United Kingdom bilaterally and as well as multilaterally within NATO. Um, thank you for putting sort of the end point to a very busy, sometimes confusing week of international affairs and cutting through it and helping us to understand uh, what's important and the, the British uh, position on that. So with your warm applause, please thank me. Thank you. Thank you.